Now everyone wants to feel heard and feel that someone wants to listen to what they have to say, but dismissive behavior communicates that what you have to say simply is not important to me. It's not important at all. Imagine you need to have a tough conversation with someone who has wronged you in some way. You pray about the situation, you get wise counsel from a therapist, a mentor, or a trusted friend, just to make sure that it's not you instead of them. You role play in order to practice having the difficult conversation. Make sure your tone is right. You purpose to use I statements so that your words can be well received. Then you finally muster up the courage to have this difficult confrontational conversation. It does not go well. You are not heard. You are not understood. The person does not even entertain the possibility that they may have wronged you at all. And you leave regretting that you even said anything in the first place. Sis. Has this ever happened to you? In that instance, it is possible that we may have experienced one or more or all of the three Ds, dismissing, denying, or deflecting. Now I'm gonna unpack all three of them and then discuss what I believe is God's perspective on these three Ds. According to Very Well Mind, dismissive behavior involves brushing off someone or ignoring them or being indifferent to them. It can be disrespectful, inconsiderate, or just downright rude. Some examples of dismissive statements are the following. Words or phrases. Whatever. That doesn't really matter. You are overreacting. Why are you making such a big deal out of this? There are also dismissive actions, things like rolling your eyes, not making eye contact when someone is speaking to you, sighing as if you are so tired and completely just walking away while someone is in the act of talking to you. When and if this happens, the person that it happens to is left feeling unimportant and devalued. Now everyone wants to feel heard and feel that someone wants to listen to what they have to say, but dismissive behavior communicates that what you have to say simply is not important to me. It's not important at all. Sometimes when we attempt to have a difficult conversation, the other person may deny what we are saying altogether. This is what it says in psychology today. It says that denial is a defense mechanism in which an individual refuses to recognize or even acknowledge objective facts or experiences, completely dismisses evidence. It is an unconscious process that serves to protect the person from discomfort or anxiety. Honestly, when you have factual evidence that supports an occurrence and another person bold face looks you in the eye and completely denies it, that can make anyone feel frustrated and angry and possibly start to question what they know or thought they knew to be true. This can be done with statements like, I don't know what you're talking about. I never said that. I never did that. It didn't happen that way. I, that's not how I remember it. Sometimes in a confrontational situation, a person may shift the focus or responsibility onto something or someone else. It might be you, and this is called deflecting. A classic example of this, parents, you might recognize this example, is when we are breaking up a disagreement among the siblings, and then you ask the, the child, little Jimmy, why did you hit so-and-so? And little Jimmy says, well, he, he started it. A deflecting person completely absolves themselves of any 
responsibility and simply places all of the ownership on another person and insists that person might be you. The devil made me do it, right Eve? This is another way of protecting oneself from experiencing uncomfortable emotions like anxiety, pain, guilt, or distress. According to an article in Very Well Mind, people deflect because people don't want to feel bad about themselves. I get that. Nobody want to feel bad about themselves or look bad in front of others. They don't want people to think that they've made a mistake or they're at fault in any way. They want to be liked and looked up to. They don't want to admit even to themselves that they may have done something wrong. Whew. In each of these three D's, the person dismissing, denying, and deflecting is demonstrating a lack of humility either knowingly or subconsciously, but for those of us who believe in Jesus Christ, we are not given any out. One of my favorite go-to scriptures when I feel my pride rising up a bit is found in Philippians 2, 1 through 8, and it says this, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then girlfriend, it doesn't say girlfriend, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Here it comes. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility. Huh. Value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others. And your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who was humble, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he used this to make himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself even unto death. Y'all, Christ is giving us the model for how we should engage in relationships. We may not want to own the responsibility we have in a relationship for hurting someone else. It may feel painful to accept the responsibility. We may just think they're not right and it's not true. And we don't want to admit that we are anything less than perfect. But this is what humility requires of us. It requires that we own our wrongdoing. Now, if we are not in the seat of the perpetrator and whether we find ourselves in the seat of the perpetrated, there are some other things that I think we need to do. We are the ones who have been wronged over and over again. Let me just say this is cause for evaluation of that particular relationship. I would definitely start with prayer. In my experience, God has used books to alert me to behaviors that are not okay in my relationships. I've told many of you about them. With that said, when he alerted me, I did not act immediately. I typically mull over it a bit and then I talk to a therapist and maybe a trusted friend to see if it's me and not them. I also look for a pattern in the behavior, in the relationship. Friends, we are all imperfect and we will likely deny, deflect, and dismiss occasionally. But the question becomes, is the person willing to own it? and accept responsibility for it and apologize and repent or turn away from the behavior? If the answer is no, this may be cause to evaluate whether the friendship is sustainable. But what if it is in a more critical relationship like mother, father, sibling, or even a spouse? I would say pray even more and strongly consider getting a sound, wise, and seasoned therapist that is familiar with this type of behavior in this specific type of relationship. 
You will need someone who is able to guide you in confronting the individual and to also provide wise counsel if the person that you confront does not respond favorably to the confrontation, which is likely. The difficult reality is that sometimes people will not change. This is not saying that God is not powerful enough to change them. God can do anything he wants to do when he wants to do it. It is simply saying that they, the people we're talking about, continue to choose to remain the same. I understand and I have weathered many storms in this specific area. If this is where you find yourself, know that the person's behavior does not reflect the heart of God. Not at all. God is compassionate. We see this in the interactions of Jesus with the sick and the broken and the dying and the lowly and the underserved and the forgotten and women. Jesus listened to them. There was no concern that was not important to him. Look at his words in Matthew 11, 28 and 30. I love this. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and I'm humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Or look at this scripture in 1 Peter 5, 7, one of my faves. Cast all, not some, of your anxiety on him because he cares for you. God does not endorse dismissing, denying, or deflecting. He does not engage with us in this way. And he does not want us to engage with others in this way either. It is not healthy communication. If you are experiencing one or more of these behaviors in your relationships, be encouraged sis. There is hope for our relationships to be made well. But it starts with educating ourselves, communing with God, and asking the Holy Spirit for guidance and direction, and seeking assistance when needed and where it's needed. It will also require us to make a decision of how we are going to proceed forward. Forward, sis, not backwards in light of our circumstance. I hope this has been an encouragement to you and I encourage you to join me next week as we talk about what does God say about guilt and shame.